Good morning. We uh, want to start off by apologizing for the lack of air conditioning. Uh, as an Army guy, I know it sucks to be hot, but I always try to keep it in perspective and remind everybody at least it's, it's cooler than being overseas with body armor on and climbing up a hill. I think this, uh, this group especially can appreciate that. My name is Paul Rykoff. I'm the CEO and founder of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. I want to welcome you uh, to the second version of this event. We did this last year with tremendous success and really want to build on that momentum. Um, the title of, of today's event is The New Battleground. And uh, after about 11 years of working in this space with many of you, allies, friends, partners, um, you know, I've always been guided by what some of the older veterans, especially the Vietnam veterans, told me when I first came home, which was that we need to stick together. And when we stick together on the battlefield, we survive. And when we stick together at home, we thrive. And I, I'm always bolstered by the support we get from our partners and friends in the military coalition especially. So I want to start out by, by thanking them uh, for their support for this organization uh, as, as kind of their little brothers as we were coming up in this town. Uh, they looked out for us. They gave us guidance. They showed us the way. But they also showed us that we're stronger together. Uh, and it wasn't long ago that there was another government shutdown pending. And one of the loudest, strongest, most unified voices were the military uh, and, and veterans organization. The TMC got together uh, before the World War II memorial and sent a powerful message to America that the shutdown would hurt veterans. And I think it shows what can happen when we stick together. Um, but like any battlefield, the, the situation is changing and it's dynamic. Uh, a year after where we were and we sat together to have this conversation, for many, the, the, the scandal uh, at the VA and in Phoenix seems like it's ancient history. Uh, these issues have fallen from the front pages in many ways, and in the recent uh, presidential debates, veterans were hardly mentioned. If you look at the presidential candidates, only a few of them even mentioned veterans on their website. And in two full debates, there were no questions on veterans, no substantive conversation on veterans. In the first GOP debate, the only reason there was a question on veterans is because a gold star wife, Jane Horton, who may be here later today, actually walked down and told the moderator, hey, what about, what about our veterans? So it's a, it's a dynamic and changing environment, and veterans have to chart the way. Um, we try to communicate to folks that veterans are not a charity, they're an investment. And if this city and this country and this community invests in them, they can go on and do great things. So that's part of what we want to focus on today as well, some of the good news stories. Uh, not just the, the stories of, of damaged, broken vets, but the stories of triumphant vets, entrepreneurs, leaders, uh, community activists, folks that are really changing the game. And Defense One has been a, a fantastic partner for us. Um, you know, like us, they're kind of an up-and-comer. Uh, they've made some waves, and, and they're really forcing change. Uh, and we're honored to stand with them. We also want to thank IBM, our sponsor for today. Thank you for stepping up and helping support this important conversation. Um, and a couple other things I, I want to mention is that um, you know, I think it's important that we listen to the veterans groups, especially in times like this, and to the military families and to the spouses. Um, you know, Donald Trump now very visibly had a, basically a fake veterans group endorse him a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and I know it sent ripples across the VSO and TMC community because we said, who the hell are these guys? Uh, there are knowledgeable, thoughtful, hardworking people in the VSO and MSO community every day working on the Hill, working in the community, doing outreach, and saving and changing lives. And many of you are here in the room today, uh, and I want to thank you for that. Um, lastly, maybe a, a triumphant moment that we can all look to that also, unfortunately, seems like ancient history was the Clay Hunt Suicide Prevention Act. Uh, in February, after over a year and a half of battling, uh, we finally passed that important piece of suicide legislation into law. We stood with the president, and we had Democrats and Republicans standing together. You had Jeff Miller and Nancy Pelosi within like two feet of each other on stage uh, and, and with the president. And I think it also shows what can happen when Congress sticks together, when they put politics aside, when they put aside their partisanship, and they focus on what really matters to this country and to this community. Uh, if you're following online, use the hashtag. Uh, DEF uh, ONE IAVA. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but you'll see it bounce around. And um, we encourage you to tweet, share social media, and, and spread the conversation. Uh, and lastly, I just want to send a big thank you to, to the Defense One team. Uh, a lot of hard work went into this under a compressed timeline. Uh, I want to thank Kevin Barron, especially, for his leadership uh, and the IAVA team. Um, we work on the Hill, but we've also got programs and field efforts around the country. And maybe to ground it all in, in what this is ultimately all about. Um, a few weeks ago, our rapid response referral program got six suicide calls in one day. Six. Uh, they've served uh, thousands of veterans, over 5,000 veterans in, in the last two years, and uh, they provide life-saving support for housing, mental health, 
uh, legal support, but we got six calls in one day. And many of you did see the front page article in the New York Times uh, about a Marine unit that lost far too many folks. Uh, and, and that should be a wake up call for America. But for many folks, again, it's already in the rear view mirror. So we hope that this community and this conversation can continue to drive forward. And most of all, that this group of people in this room, you care enough to be here today. And we appreciate that. We want this to be a unifying event. We want you to meet new folks and, and take this conversation out onto the hill and around the country and remember why we really do this work. It's not about uh, bills. It, it's not about meetings on the hill. It's about real people, mostly outside of this town, who have tremendous potential and can be unleashed if they have the right support. So uh, on behalf of all of us at IBA, thank you very much for being here. Uh, and I'm very proud and happy to introduce our partner, Tim Hartman, the CEO of National Journal Group, uh, and, and has been described as the godfather of Defense One, uh, kind of part of the key team that incubated this idea of Defense One. Uh, and, and before I throw it over to him, I just want to thank our media partners that are here, the folks that are here today from the media care. Uh, you're going to see folks who, who are committed to these issues, who are digging, who are investigating. Uh, some of them are, are names that you may know, some of them aren't. But um, you know, it, it's often 2 o'clock in the morning, and I get a, a direct message on Twitter from Leo Shane or someone else saying, hey, what's going on in the community? What should we be writing about? And, and that is very much appreciated in a time where, for many folks, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, are, are off the TVs and, and are off their radar. But we still have friends serving over there today. And, and that's a part of uh, this, this conversation that, that's critical to us. But Tim's been a great partner on that. Huge thanks to you. And without further ado, I want to introduce our friend and partner, Tim Hartman. Thank you, Paul, and thank everybody uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm the CEO of National Journal Group. We're the parent company of Defense One, and about three or four years ago, this was just a uh, figment of our imagination that we could have a brand like Defense One that would be covering the, futures, the future of national security among all the stakeholders, among all the issues that uh, we're contending with every day, whether it's technology, whether it's uh, the new frontiers, the new battlefields. Um, but one of the most important stakeholders that we have in covering the national security community has been the growing veterans community. And so uh, we were proud to partner with IIV last year on this event, and we're proud to partner with them again this year. They're a great partner for us. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today. It's, it's for me, representative of, of the mission that we have to be the convener of all the different stakeholders, whether it be organizations like IAVA, whether it be veterans themselves, whether it be people on the Hill or the media. Um, uh, government officials, people who work for government agencies that are trying to deliver services to veterans. Uh, this event kind of represents that for us in real life. I'd also like to thank our premier underwriter, IBM, for supporting today's event. Uh, we couldn't do these events without the support of our underwriters, so I just wanted to thank them for their ongoing support of events like these. And finally, I just want to return the, the thanks to IABA. Um, you know, this event was just an idea, I think, maybe between uh, Paul and Kevin about a year and a half ago, and it sounded like a great idea at the time, and the first event just exploded in terms of its impact and, and, um, and energy when you were there. And so uh, we said we were going to do it again, and we're glad to have them here today as a partner again. Uh, they've created, IAVA is, has created an organization now as members in 50 states. I think it's 150,000 members. It's uh, unbelievable to scale. Just as a leader, it's impressive to me. Now I'd like to introduce our first panel today. Uh, the first panel will be the state of veterans in the news from the front line to the front page. Uh, so if our panelists want to join us on stage, I'll introduce you. First, we have Leo Shane. Leo's an award-winning military and veterans affairs reporter who covers Capitol Hill and the White House for the Military Times. Uh, he's a winner of the Polk Award and a National Headliner Award for stories um, that reveal the military's practice of profiling journalists in Afghanistan. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, boss. Okay. Excuse me. We'll that die down. That's what I've learned. Um, the second person I'd like to introduce is, is uh, Brian Bender. Did you just cut his mic? Yes. <laughs> just go with that. That's better. There you go. Okay. The second person on the panel is Brian Bender. Next is Brian Bender. Brian Bender is the defense editor, is defense editor for Politico, former Boston Globe. Uh, he and Kevin have collaborated on various projects with veterans and the military. Um, I talk about Kevin Barron and, and Brian Bender as uh, two guys who, over time, gotten to know the Dos Equis man, the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> and when he comes to town, he calls Brian and Kevin so that he's the guy 
they're the guys that the most interesting man in the world calls when he comes to town, so they must be more interesting than him. Um, and then finally, without uh, needing no introduction, is Paul Rykoff. He's the founder of and chief executive officer of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Uh, as I mentioned, they've uh, represented in 50 states, 150,000 members, that the mission is to improve the lives of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans and their fam families. And then finally, we have our uh, impresario, uh, Kevin Barron, the impresario for Defense One. Uh, as Kevin said, I was uh, searching for how we were going to bring Defense One to life when we were launching it, uh, and really all I had to do was uh, hire Kevin Barron. So the biggest thing I did was hire Kevin Barron and say, go off and, and fulfill this mission, and uh, he's done a great job of it. So uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our panel for this discussion. OK, I'm turning this back on. I hope that the levels balance out. Um, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Hello, thank you. Thanks for that overly kind introduction, boss. Um, and for our panelists for joining us, um, and for everyone for coming out this morning through traffic uh, into the right end of the heart of Washington. Um, so we're going to start, I think, we're going to start this morning by, I think, explaining how we came about the, with the ideas for today's panels and what we're going to talk about today because it was a little challenging. Uh, last year when this happened, um, I'll, I'll give credit to Stephanie Gaskell, our former deputy editor, for helping uh, create this event last year. Um, it was a little easier because the VA wasn't screaming headlines in the front page. Uh, it was front page news. It was, uh, there was a scandal. There was a new secretary coming in. It was our first event. So when we came around time to start planning for this year, when Paul and I were speaking with our teams, um, he was the one who said, you know, can we do something that's a little different, you know, not, not another panel on veterans and suicide, and not another panel on veterans and, and how, how to hire a veteran, something a little bit uh, different because things are changing. Um, and it's a good point to make, I think, that things are changing because we've been at war for 15 years straight, and it doesn't look like the next 15 years are going to be any different. But it's a different kind of war. It's a different kind of veteran and a different kind of uh, uh, experience in the military that those soldiers and sail sailors and airmen and the Marine will bring out in, uh, to the private sector when they get there. Um, and part of that is uh, what, what do we should talk about, I think, is what do we talk about in the news? And what are our policymakers and advocacy groups talking about here in Washington? And that all came to a head very colorfully last week, <laughs> as, uh, as Paul mentioned, I think, with, or the week before, with uh, the, the CNN debate um, with Jake Tapper hosting when there, there were no veterans questions being raised. And, uh, you know, Paul and I spoke. Paul made a, made a big... Uh, stink about it as the, the head of an advocacy group would, as you would expect, and got into a bit of a Twitter war with, with uh, Jake Tapper, who eventually announced that CNN was starting its own page for veterans issues. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> well, so, you know, Paul tends to get what he, gets what he, get what he wants, which is uh, uh, good for an advocate. Um, but I, I, I think I, f I found myself in the middle of that uh, Twitter war where I, I said to Paul, you know, you're the advocate and I'm the newsman, and I don't really blame him for not asking a veteran's question with that short time in that panel. And he said, yeah, but there are some issues really he could have talked about. And you know, I think Paul had a good point. He could have talked about some things. So here, to, unfortunately, Jake couldn't make it himself, but he said, have a great event. But we do have here. Leo Shane, who really is the veterans reporter in town. Are there any others? I mean, you have like your own beat. There's several in the audience here. Not... <laughs> that was your chance. Okay. That was your yeah. chance. No, there's no others. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, Leo, who was, uh, oh, I, we were teammates at Stars and Stripes uh, many, many years ago. Well, not that. <coughs> um, Brian Bender, who is uh, just this year became the defense editor at Politico, was uh, 15 years of the Boston Globe. Um, Brian likes to say that he. Um, he discovered me, but basically he was the one who first walked me into the Pentagon as a reporter. It's more like deny. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and Paul in the end. So uh, let me start. Let me start with you, Leo. I mean, as a as a, as a veteran, with veterans as your beat. I mean, you're a Hill reporter, but veterans is, is part of your beat. Um, what do you see right now? Are the stories that make it through to your level that you're going to write about, but then the ones that make it up to you know CNN, Jake Tapper on the afternoon news? Yeah, we're still. I mean, you know, everything is colored by the the care scandal last year. So the things that make it into national news are still. Uh, the scandals or the headlines or the uh, you know the missteps by the right. VA, um, and really, really that's about it. If it's if it's a, a catchy IG report, uh, if it's a problem um, that's going on with uh, with accountability, with folks not being fired, those will make the national headlines. For for myself and for some of the other folks who cover it as beat, 
Um, you know, we're still covering a lot of the issues we've been covering for the last you know, five years. For some folks, it's uh, longer than that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the backlog. It's uh, the backlog of disability benefits. Um, it's the continued reintegration issues. Um, it's, it's unemployment, but it's unemployment not on the level that you'll hear uh, necessarily from the national perspective, which is, oh my God, veterans can't get jobs. No, it's actually veterans have done a better job getting jobs, but um, are now trying to figure out what's, a, what's the next step for a career. What, are they getting into the right jobs? Are they getting into uh, not just, you know, is unemployment low enough? Um, but it's, uh, you know, as a as a beat, as a as a topic, um, it is still it's still on the sidelines for the most part. We had that we had 2014. We had a cabinet secretary resign. We had defense reporters. Everybody sort of rush in, and in the lack of a scandal, uh, you know, we've we've had that that vacuum develop again. So, you know, Brian, I, I, I often will say, you know, it's, it's not news if the sun rises, it's, it's news if it doesn't, uh, you know, if that's the case. So you're now at, at Politico, for example, which has a pretty robust defense team. Uh, how do you cover veterans' issues over there? Well, I mean, the truth is we don't cover veterans' issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Obviously, there are stories that bubble up, particularly on Capitol Hill. As, as Leo said, if there's a controversy of some sort, an investigation, um, but I think on a larger level, there are kind of two major challenges when it comes to veterans issues breaking through on a more sustained basis. And I think one is simply, and, and maybe Paul can talk about this too, is that you know we have a country, by and large, very disconnected from the military. We almost have a Praetorian Guard that serves in the active duty less than 1%, and because because of that, I think there is just, by definition, uh, less focus on it. I think if, if the American people felt that some of these issues that veterans are dealing with are also issues that they potentially would have to deal with or their family would have to deal with, people would pay more attention. And I think, by definition, the news would cover it in a more sustained way, not just when it's um, a scandal. And I think maybe the second reason why it doesn't get as much focus, and this is kind of a consequence of just the way Washington works. There are interest groups when it comes to veterans, but they don't have a lot of money, and they don't lobby to the same extent that industries do. Um, and I think you, know, you have a sort of this creature of Washington that tends to give more attention to the issues that people are really pushing for, really advocating for, really fighting for. And I think veterans have this challenge that they're not really a vested interest, like a lot of these other interests in Washington trying to get on the agenda. Uh, and they're also an issue that everybody seems to agree on. In other words, we all support our troops. We all think that veterans should be taken care of. Um, so I think, therefore, it kind of falls aside because you know, if it's not controversial, um, and, and often every day, day in, day out, it's not controversial, um, it just doesn't get a lot of attention. I mean, that's interesting. There's a lot of, you know, media theory uh, stuff to extrapolate out of there. You know, does, if, if more people cared about it, would it become news, you know, with, or, or vice versa? Maybe if more, there was more coverage of it, more people would care about it. Let's uh, ask Paul to chime in. What, from your perspective, you know, what, what, is it, what do you see are the stories that are making news? What are the stories that you wish were making news more often? And what's, what's changed these last couple of years as really Iraq and Afghanistan and, and a different kind of fighting has started to emerge? That yeah, maybe I'll start about. with the second question because I think that's maybe the most interesting one. I think what's changed, especially in the last year and a half, is that media groups and media companies have actually realized that veteran stories can make money. I think you, you have a new crop of media entities that are focused on the defense industry, that are focused on military and veterans affairs, can sell advertising to companies and, and folks that are trying to reach that. And you've got folks that are writing some really great stuff that's cracking through, and then you've got a lot of chatter. And maybe to draw an interesting parallel, there was a time in Hollywood where folks said, people don't care about the wars. They don't want to see movies about the wars. This was 2004, 2008. Films had come out, and they all pretty much flopped. Then Lone Survivor came out. Right? Then American Sniper came out. Right? And American Sniper has shown that people actually do care about these stories if it's a good story. 
right? If it actually is a good story, if it's good entertainment, if it's really done well, people will, will, will gravitate to that subject matter. I think the same is true for veterans journalism, frankly. When you've got, I think it was Dave Phillips who wrote the piece in the New York Times above the fold last Sunday about suicide. It was a really good story, heartbreaking, wretching story, but it was investigated well, it was fantastically personal, um, you know, the supporting components were there, the digital pieces online were great. So I think if you get it right and you do it well, people actually do care and they do respond to it. And I think, frankly, CNN would probably tell you the same thing because just like following that missing plane, they stayed on the VA scandal because people actually cared and they watched it and they tuned in. And we've heard from the White House and others that they actually know that these issues do resonate profoundly with people in the communities and they do care. Um, but there's been this evolution where there was a point a couple years ago where I thought Leo might be the only veterans reporter left because folks started moving to different beats. They were moving away from Iraq and Afghanistan. And then there was a change and people started designating veterans and military affairs reporters. New groups like yours popped up. Arizona Republic maybe is, is a really good example of a group that's now basically built a side of their business on the VA scandal, just staying on on that doing really good reporting and they have a whole team that, that works on that. So I think the, the business side of this has changed and I think that's an important driver in the media business that struggles to make money. Um, on the issues, there's no shortage. I mean, it can be women in the military. It can be transgendered people in the military. It can be service dogs. I mean, there are a lot of different issues that we can dig into and I think most importantly around the presidential election, what is your vision for the VA? Do you want to privatize the whole thing? Do you think it's great the way it is? How are you going to manage? Maybe some of them are listening. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but we have to really ask if, if the presidential election, and guys, we're sorry about all the technical difficulties. Um, we'll work through them. And if need be, we can just take the mics off and holler. Um, but I think the presidential election is going to dominate the news. So what we as, as advocates and as activists have to do is force the candidates to talk about that. There are big differences between the candidates on big issues like how are you going to run a $170 billion plus agency that's second only to the Pentagon. That's a big question. And you want to be commander in chief? How are you going to take care of these people? How are you going to talk to these people? And keep in mind, there's over 20 million of them and they vote. IAVA members voted about 95%. So I think that that political story and how the two intersect is maybe the biggest story for the next couple of years. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, it, Paul brings up a really interesting point. In 2014, uh, you know, we had the midterm elections. We had just had the VA scandal. Um, but really, the refrain we were hearing on the campaign trail was, you know, we need to help veterans. I mean, there, there, was, there was virtually no difference in what the candidates were, were saying at that point. This, this election's more interesting. There, there is the issue of, uh, you know, are the Republican candidates pushing broader choice or privatization? Um, you know, can the Democratic candidates defend some of the accountability, some of the choices that have been made by the Obama administration? Um, but there is, there is a learning curve with all this. And to, you know, to both, uh, to, to what Brian said, you know, we're, we're chasing things we think our readers are going to be interested in or what our readers should be interested in. Um, and, and for a lot of times, if, I, if I'm writing a veteran story for veterans groups, I'm preaching to the choir. These, these folks already know this. They've lived through this. They've been following this. What we saw in 2014 was, a, was this public realization that, oh my god, the, the VA might be a mess. Um, I had, I, I've, I've heard from, from many people who don't know veterans, who don't have that connection to the to the 1% that, you know, they just assumed the VA was, was another bureaucracy that was working fine. And that's, you know, a, a little bit of willful ignorance there. Um, you know, just uh, treating it like a, another section of the DMV and we all complain about it a little bit. No, there's, you know, <laughs> some really serious issues, some really serious scandals that need to be, to be addressed here. So as we, as we see more public awareness, as we see more public interest in this, you get more political interest, you get more, uh, you get more news coverage. And there's another side of it too, which is kind of the, the veterans insurgency campaign, where we've started to infiltrate the media. I mm -hmm. mean, there are now veterans who are writers, there are veterans who are on TV, you know, you've got Patrick Murphy on MSNBC, you've got Pete Hegseth on Fox, um, and you've got folks like John Oliver, who's married to an Iraq vet and tries to find places to, to put those issues in. Uh, John Stewart, you know, Colbert, so many others that cross over. Even Larry, I went on Larry Wilmore to talk about American Sniper. There were these crossover points that I think are actually sometimes more important than the inner beltway chatter that can become an echo chamber. Well, you get to a point that I, that's been in my mind listening to you, which, which is the difference in stories between policy stories and human interest stories, right? And, and or thematic versus episodic mm -hmm. is one way to look at them. So we can write about. Um, 
you know, a VA scandal, you know, the national press corps has to cover that. It's a cabinet level scandal that the president has to address. Uh, you, can, you can write about a suicide bill, or you can write about the GI, all these things. Or like you just said, one of the most remarkable stories recently was this one in the New York Times, which was a b beautiful story. It was an investigative story. It took a lot of time, a lot of resources. But really, it was kind of just another story about suicide yet again. I mean, I've read one after another after another for you know, five, ten, however many years now. And they're beautiful I think it was and different brilliant. But I think it was bigger than that. I mean, that, that, I, I mean I'm, in some ways, my inbox is a barometer for how much it crosses over. Mm -hmm. and, and I can't remember a story in the last year and a half where so many people outside the veteran space emailed me about a story. That story was different because it was drawing a macro conclusion and it was telling a really personal story. We all knew about 2-7. All of us knew about how many suicides are happening in that unit. And I've actually pitched that story to reporters over the years. Ah, you know, that story's been told. But I really think, you know, Kevin, it, it was different. And but it was also, what I mean is, it was also front page in your Times, yeah. uh, which is great. It takes that kind of level of, of, of resource to cover. You, you got to a point before and you said about the business. What, what I'm wondering is, what, what specific issues could you see that, that aren't getting covered or that may be coming out? You mentioned women as, as an example. I wonder about um, special ops, intelligence, the, you know, the groups that are doing a lot of the fighting that we just don't hear about as much anymore. Or the opposite, which is um, a new crop of, of veterans who will not see combat. They may not even deploy. You know, this is not the the last decade. And what is that? What is? How does that change? You know, both uh, the discussion and and the, and the media and really what uh, policymakers will focus on. Yeah, Brian. Um, you know, you know, I think these issues will continue to bubble up because, quite frankly, as we all know, the VA doesn't work. So there's going to be more scandals, or there's going to be more revelations about things like the New York Times piece on the Marine unit. Um, and may, it may be in the Special Forces community. It may be um, somewhere else in the military. Um, but you know, it, you know, it's interesting. I think what Paul has been doing, what IAVA has been doing, has been critical. Because I think, ultimately, it's going to be the lobbying efforts of the community itself and raising these issues and badgering reporters to cover this that's going to get uh, the attention and the focus on the issues that, that, that need focus on. What I find interesting, you talked about the VA scandal in Arizona and how that was sort of front and center and then it kind of dropped off. You know, most of those veterans that, that it looks like from the IG reports were waiting and waiting and waiting for care and didn't get it and died were not Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. But uh, a lot of the focus in the news seems to be the current generation. And, and, I, and I wonder what, what your thoughts would be on why there's not more attention on the older generation, which is this huge bubble right now, particularly sure. Vietnam era. These guys are getting old. They're very sick, many of them. Um, and that seems to get much less attention um, uh, than the current generation. I'm just curious what, what you guys think about yeah. that. I, I think it, it has to do with resources. And, and when you put the time in and you put the money in and, and, and the staff time into doing good journalism, you get a good result. Um, but I also think it has to do with cultural competency. You know, there, there aren't too many Joey Galloways, right? You've got somebody like CJ at the Times and others who've come from our community and crossed over. But the disconnect that drives the civil military divide across our society is, is immediately apparent in the, in, in the media. Um, where, you know, I don't know if there, maybe you guys can think of any vets who are in your crew on the Hill working every day. I mean, maybe hard to think of any, right? So that cultural yeah. competency and that knowledge of, of the insides of how the military works, the insides of how the VA works is missing, uh, just like it is in every other element of society. And I think that's dramatically impacted our, our media coverage. Um, and, and I do think that there are, another example is how many writers are coming out, you know, novelists and playwrights and screenwriters that are coming out of the post 9-11 community because they're basically dissatisfied with the way our stories have been told. They said, you're not telling our story, we're going to tell it ourselves. I actually met Oliver Stone one day and had a conversation with him with a few other veterans and one of the veterans said to him, you've got to tell our story. You told you know, these, these epic, iconic stories from Vietnam and he looked at us and, and, and said, I can't tell your story, you have to tell your story. I don't know your story. I wasn't there. And I think that that's ultimately how we're going to drive this, this forward, and especially in the political accountability. We've been asking everybody to ask hard questions of candidates on both sides. We're nonpartisan. It's not happening. So we're going to send our veterans into the town halls. We're going to take the social media. We're going to force the candidates from both sides to answer those tough questions and ask every American to do the same.
So I want to hear from the audience. You're here. You care about veterans issues enough to be here, and you've got us in front of you. So think, get to get your hands ready. And I'll, I'll ask one more from Leo. How does this then all translate onto um, Capitol Hill? You cover the hill. Um, <laughs> you cover there. There you go. You cover the hill. Um, what? What are the lawmakers paying attention to? Yeah, I mean, and you've, not paying attention. To? You've always had your core of, uh, of veterans affairs lawmakers. Um, although it's it, unlike unlike the uh, Armed Services Committee and some of the other committees that we cover, um, turnover is high. It's not a it's not a money making committee. Um, it's a it's a committee where you get a lot of freshmen, you get a lot of folks who may stay for a couple of years yeah. and then move on to to other ones, but. Um, but those committees have done uh, a, a very good job of, of keeping a focus on those issues and, and keeping, um, you know, keeping heat on the VA. What we saw after 2014 was uh, the rest of Congress getting a big learning curve over uh, what was going on with VA, what were some of the issues, and what were some of the problems. So, uh, so you hear a lot of discussion of, uh, about veterans and ways you can help veterans of Capitol Hill. It, it seems to be six to nine months behind what's actually uh, needed or going on a lot of the time. Uh, you know, we hear folks talking about the ways to, to solve the disability backlog now. Well, that's that's dropped, you know, 200,000 cases in the last year. So it's not a solved issue, but an issue that's at least on the right track. You hear folks introducing new legislation for uh, for veterans unemployment. Again, that's a that's an issue that is less of less of a problem than some of the other ones. But, you know, there is there's the Clay Hunt suicide bill. There are some issues where uh, it's a focus. You know, everyone everyone wants to be supportive of veterans. Everybody wants to be uh, finding ways to, to help them out. Um, and I think 2014 was a wake up call for a lot of a lot of lawmakers who weren't involved in day to day stuff to start to pay attention to those issues and start to, to bring that in. So was I mean, bottom line. I mean, I remember you know Bernie Sanders before the world knew who he was was kind of defending the VA a little bit, saying, look, yeah, the VA has its problems, but on the whole, this is a huge. He was chair of the hmm? right? This is. I'll give you one story yeah. that I've been pitching to folks for the last six months. He was the chairman of That's SVAC famous. during the VA scandal. Yeah. That's a story. Let's talk, you want to be commander in chief, let's ask some hard questions of Bernie Sanders about why he didn't do more, why he didn't hold more oversight hearings, why at times we and others called him out for basically being an apologist for the VA as the scandal erupted around him. So it happens on both sides. You've yeah. got Trump who basically is, is endorsed by a fraudulent veterans group and there aren't a lot of hard questions being asked there. And you've got Bernie Sanders who was literally at the helm of the most important committee on these issues in the midst of the scandal. So I, I think those are hard questions that reporters need to ask. That send beyond the veterans community and cut to the core of, of leadership. And maybe most encouraging is the new crop of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans on the Hill from both parties. The post 9-11 Veterans Caucus that we helped create recently uh, is going to be represented today by Perry and, and Gabbard on both sides. Those folks are forcing that conversation forward. But it's not sexy to be on HVAC. It's not sexy to be on SVAC. It doesn't raise you big money and you don't really launch from there into somewhere else. They gave it to Bernie Sanders because they had to give him something. So what was left? SVAC. And that's why he got SVAC. Hmm. Wow. Uh, just, just a quick point on that. I, I do think it's interesting that even though supporting veterans dealing with some of these problems does have bipartisan support, and you and I have talked about this, I think, uh, there is also, I think, a new brand of partisanship that does exist where both parties tend to use veterans' issues oh, yeah. to further uh, other aims. <laughs> and I think. <laughs> Politicians using the troops, come no. on. But I think <laughs> yeah, but veteran stuff used to be kind of off limits. It, it used to be off limits. It. It I think it's much it. more pronounced. I mean, Bernie Sanders defended the VA, in my opinion, because going after it and really rooting out what was wrong with it would be admitting that government-run health care doesn't work. And Bernie Sanders supports government-run health care. Um, and then on the other side, you mentioned concerned veterans for America. I mean, they are a very conservative, very politically involved, organization that tries to sell itself as a, just a purely veterans organization, but they're a political organization. They get people elected who have very conservative values, very hawkish military values. So that's sort of a topic maybe for a whole other panel. But I do think that there is an undertone of that that, at least in my 15 to 20 years in Washington, was not as pronounced. Good. Questions for the audience? Um, here we are. That's right. Ah. I'm Scott Cooper. I'm Sorry about that, guys. He's a Marine. He can, he can, <laughs> he can scream it loud. I can uh, take my drone if you want. Well, I'd like to draw you in a little bit more. You mentioned one of the hard questions to ask, but can you share with us some of the questions that you think 
um, especially um, on both sides of the aisle, as a nonpartisan organization, yeah. which I would submit, you know, again, most of these veterans organizations are mostly yeah, I mean, we, so we've tried I'll to... i repeat for the recording. The question yeah. uh, was, what should the presidential candidates be asked, uh, both sides of the aisle, as from a nonpartisan organization? If you go to iava.org backslash iava votes right now, we've got all the candidates listed. We can tell you who served in the military, who hasn't. By the way, only four of the candidates have. Who actually has even mentioned veterans in a section on their website? I think only four or five have. Um, and we've got a list of questions that are not driven by me or even by our staff, but by by our membership, and our membership wants to hear about how are you going to stop suicide? You're commander in chief, okay? How are you going to stop the suicide rate that's taking our friends all around us? Uh, how are you going to reform VA? Like, you want to show government can work? You want to show you can change things? There's no better challenge for you than the VA. If you can fix the VA, maybe you can create world peace. But, but that is something that no one wants to touch. And what they do do is the opposite, which is, I'm going to clean up the VA which is the new political throwaway line in the way I'm going to clean up Washington used to be a political throwaway line. They say it, there's no details, but it just sounds really good. How are you going to support women veterans? About 20% of our membership is made up of female veterans, about 35% of our leadership. Uh, and they consistently have been underserved and underappreciated across the spectrum of our country's uh, military and veteran systems. And I think a very important issue that continues to come forward for our members, how are you going to protect the GI Bill? How are you going to protect our veterans from predatory uh, for-profit schools that have rampaged over the benefit and have screwed and ripped off a lot of people to the point where you know, a, a school without a football team can sponsor a stadium where the Super Bowl is happening? You know, the University of Phoenix had a stadium where the Super Bowl was played, and they don't even have a football team. I mean, it's in part because they've made so much money over the last few years around the GI Bill. And I, these are not Paul's issues. These are IAVA's members' issues. I urge you to go to our website, see our survey, and talk to the other TMC members who have that experience and have important issues. And one last one I would say is the, the Agent Orange issue. How are you going to take care of Vietnam vets? They are really uh, facing a crush of health issues, and that's not anywhere near the front pages. Good. I'm checking my timer. We have a little more time. Yep, great. Let's go to this gentleman right here in the middle. Uh, my name is Paul Schwinn. And I'm, I'm, this is a question for the panel. I'm concerned about how the, the way the word veteran is used. Last year, there was two. Bill Clay, who won the National Book Award. Bad Bradley Michael Stone, who was a fugitive for a little while, guilty, I think, of killing his father. And all the stories on Phil Clay, none of the headlines said Marine Vet. And every single headline on Bradley Stone said Marine Vet. And I'm just wondering, how do we clean up the word vet and have it mean something that we can own instead of a guy who's going to commit suicide, has PTSD and needs our help, versus this is a guy who just won the national What do you think, Brian or, or Leo? Are, do we describe, do we, do we mention that someone is a veteran too often when it's you know, that kind of a case? No, I mean, a new story? I think. I guess I have faith in American readers that they know that if you're referring to a veteran, there are stories that are about the 99.9% .9 of them that serve their country and deserve to be taken care of. And I think they can tell the difference between that and use of the word veteran because somebody you know served in the army and then committed some crime. You know, I think the word veteran is used maybe in the in the, the negative case more because. Um, Maybe it's more unconscious than it is conscious, but it sort of denotes an experience with guns, an experience with violence. Um, but I, you know, but again, I, I, I think it's semantics. I mean, I think people understand that most veterans are great Americans who serve their country. And oh, I, I think it's deeper than that. I'll yeah. push, yeah, I'll push yeah. back a little bit on that because we, I, I think, I think we as the media have gotten better. I mean, not, not our organizations were perfect, but um, I think we as the media have gotten better. There, there's the, there's the scary monster of PTSD out there, and there's a lot of unfamiliarity um, with, with military service and what it means and what, what traumatic brain injury actually results in, what PTSD means. So you do. You know, whenever there's a, a mass shooting, whenever there's a tragedy, there is a knee-jerk response for for a lot of different groups, and veterans are among them. You know, we we also see Muslim thrown in there uh, immediately if if uh, if religion's a factor. Um, you know, we've seen race thrown in there on, on a number of things. So, uh, veterans, unfortunately, for for some of those tragedies, uh, get get thrown in the same 
oh, this might be a cause group. Um, I think it has gotten better. I feel like over the years, uh, groups like, like Paul's and um, some other groups who have, have pushed back against this have, have done a better job educating the population on PTSD is not a scary monster, it's going to kill us all. But, um, but that, that is going to be a factor. Um, I don't, I, on, on the Phil Clay stuff though, I, rem I mean, I, I felt like those stories specifically that talked a lot about his writing, which, which of course involved that. Um, but I, I do feel like there's a, we're, we're getting to, to a better mix of some of the positive reintegration, what are veterans doing stories, and the, uh, you know, are veterans going to be scary? But look, it's, as, as long as you've got a, a civilian military divide, as long as you've got a population that doesn't really understand what military service was, and uh, you have so many people who didn't serve, you're going to have that, that unfamiliarity, unfamiliarity, you're going to have that factor of, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know you, and, and you dealt with guns, so maybe you're a threat to me. We're going to have to be that much more vigilant because we're going from a point where we were 12, 13 percent of the population, where it's going to shrink down to single digits. I mean, the veterans' population is around, you know, call it 22 million, and we're going to lose like a quarter in the next 10 years. So as a constituency, we're going to drop in numbers and in power tremendously. So we're going to have to innovate, and we're going to have to adapt. But I think it does co cut to a very core. Uh, problem that the country does not fully understand what a veteran is. And, and somebody told me once the only people that it's still okay to stereotype in America are people who are overweight, Muslims, and veterans. And, and I think that, that in my experience that's been true. Well, we'll have a lot more to talk about throughout the day uh, on that note. Um, thanks for your insights. You know, I, I think uh, th this should set up the day very well. We're, we, we are at a new point um, for, in the history for the military, for fighting overseas, for the, veteran ex for the military experience, which will create a new veteran experience. We probably don't even know what's to come yet. And so I, I think we'll have plenty of challenges for these reporters to cover, for us to cover, and for uh, Paul to be um, harping on our inboxes about as well. Um, so thanks to these gentlemen, please. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you.